Kahi has expanded our partnership with IU's Arts and Humanities Council, including in the organization of this and other Meet the Author events. So we join with the, with the council in extending our greetings both to our speakers today, Ross Gay and Jay Cameron Carter, and to you, our audience. It is my true pleasure to introduce Ross and Jay to you today. Ross Gay is professor of English in the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. His books of poetry include Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, winner of the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award and the 2016 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award and finalist for the 2015 National Book Award in Poetry. Uh, he's also the author of Bringing the Shovel Down, Against Which and More. His 2019 collection of essays, The Book of Delights, received the 2020 Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana Authors Award in the nonfiction category. Be Holding, which he will be reading from, was his late, is his latest book of poetry and was just released in September. Ross's work has been rec recognized with numerous additional accolades, including from the Guggenheim Foundation and Breadloaf, among others. When asked about his inspiration a few years ago, he said that, quote, what always enters the poems and makes them happen is the world and the things in it and the real breathing beings in it. My own world, words simply can't do justice to Ross and the beauty of his work. So I wanna just read a brief passage from his piece, The Joy of Caring for Others, which appeared in the New York Times this past May. In the piece, Ross speaks eloquently to our lives today in the times of coronavirus, describing a quote, tender figuring out how to reach toward while staying away dance, the reaching toward despite, the million gestures that carry all the figuring it out, all the wondering how to be close without touching, which is also to say how to be together in our sorrow, how to be together in our need, our need for one another, which is profound and good for each other's touch. We are also very fortunate to have had J. Cameron Carter recently join our faculty as Professor of Religious Studies, also in the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. His research explores Black social life as it intersects the sacred as the deviant scene of alternative practices of the sacred. He is the author of Race, a Theological Account, and has recently completed a manuscript called Black Rapture, a Poetics of the Sacred. A wide ranging scholar and writer, he has received a number of awards, including a fellowship at the National Humanities Center. Jay works at the intersection of questions of race and the current ecological ravaging of the earth. He's interested in what these intertwined issues have to do with the modern world generally and with the Americas more specifically as a unique religious situation or phenomenon. So a warm welcome now to Ross and Jay. Ross will start by reading from his new work, Be Holding. He and Jay will then engage in conversation and will leave some time at the end for questions from the audience. So please feel free to leave questions in the chat and we will relay them. Ross and Jay, welcome and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, Deb and Alex, it's really good to be here. Um, and really good to be, um, share a little bit of work with you all. And then I'm really excited to talk with Jay about this, uh, just about stuff. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just like so glad that, that Jay's um, working here now. And um, um, yeah, I sat in on his class last year, last, whenever that was. <laughs> and it was just wonderful, transformative, and actually it helped me um, think about this book a lot. This is called Beholding. The book is called Beholding. And um, I'm just going to read a little bit to start us off. And um, at the beginning of the book, there's um, a bound in gratitude, um, a beholden. This poem does not exist without the work and ideas and words of many, many writers and thinkers. Among them, Amiri Baraka, Garnett Cadigan, Toy Derricott, Araceli Skirmai, Saidia Hartman, Alan Iverson, Fred Moten, Kevin Kwashi, Patrick Rosal, Christina Sharp, and Susan Sontag, by which I mean the work and thinking and care and words are indebted to them and are sometimes actually there. I should tell you before I start that kind of the central, like sort of, um, I don't know what you call it, the thing that, that the poem kind of keeps coming back to is this move from the 1980 NBA Finals, this layup that Dr. J made um, and I describe it quite a bit, but just want you to know, it was in the NBA Finals in 1980 against the Lakers. 
Kareem and Magic and Jamal Wilkes and all of them. And it's, you know, according to some people, the prettiest layup ever in the history of basketball, the NBA certainly. And, um, you know, for those of you who don't know who Dr. J is, basketball player of 70s and 80s, um, without Dr. J, there's no Michael Jordan, there's no LeBron James, um, et cetera. You might get the feeling of my reverence as we go on. Um, there's an epigraph to the book, to be held, to behold. That's Christina Sharp from In the Wake on Blackness and Being. Beholding. And you might have noticed there's nowhere to go. The wind cutting little eddies at your collarbones and behind your ear as Dr. J drives from the foul line extended to the baseline, defended valiantly by Mark Landsberger, who in this poem, despite the doofy urge to make him so, is not allegorical, but is rather simply a hardworking journeyman ball player with decent athleticism and size and a floppy mop of dusty blonde hair who got caught up in the gust, sliding his size 16s quick so that Doc after catching the ball at the elbow and taking one hard dribble where the dunk would usually commence, could not access the paint or the lane or the key, which is what we call the area nearest the goal, which in this case is an iron hole drawn in space and therefore implies a window. So the key makes it also a door that Landsberger, it seemed, was trying to keep shut. And so Doc left. He left his seat, which means more or less jumping with the ball with nowhere to go and which we're warned against by coaches from day one for the ensuing requisite stupid pass or more simply though no less stupid travel, also called walking, which the leaping often leads to keep your feet again and again, which makes the leaping, leaving your feet, sound sacrificial. The way in certain places, certain countries or countries inside of countries, you must leave by foot with nowhere to go, which there is. And Doc, you should note, after the one dribble, clasps the ball with only his right hand without once at all in any shape or form using the left, which, among other things, differentiates this move, friends, from all the descendant moves, Kevin Durant, Dwayne Wade, Steph and Giannis and Harden and Kawhi. Yes, Bron Bron too. I shall not be moved. And using only one hand, which is amazing, but not yet miraculous, more a physical and therefore genetic fact. Thanks, Ma and Pa Irving. Doc's hand becomes an octopus, gripping the ball, nothing like prey. And with that ball snugged in his mitt, Doc maybe kind of sort of thought something like, I'm going to put this schmuck the schmuck in this case being Landsberger, though do not please revert to a simplistic allegorization of the journeyman, which word I repeat advisedly, on a poster. I am gonna put this schmuck on a poster. Though schmuck is a word I'd be surprised to hear Doc say. And the word posterize, common usage, posterize his ass, you might be thinking is a bit of an anachronism in this poem, in this move, which, ostensibly occurred in the 1980 NBA Finals, so we all know that nothing happens only when it happens. We all know nothing happens only when it happens. Emerging more in the epic, which in the NBA lasts three to five years, following Doc's retirement, Neek and Jordan, Hakeem the Dream and Clyde the Glide, Barkley the Glove, and yo, remember Sean Kemp? Though Doc probably thought it anyway, visionary that he was, when will they keep, when will they verb what I keep doing to these schmucks, especially Bill fucking Walton, driving from the foul line extended toward the baseline as the unsuspecting Landsberger, who did a fine job of shuffling his size 16s and not holding, keeping Irving from the key, and who must for a scant and fleeting moment have felt a degree of pride when Doc after the hard dribble right, left his feet with nowhere to go. Billy Cunningham, the coach on the sideline, his hands on his hips, his sport coat thrown open, a few strands of hair stuck to his mo moist pink brow and almost smiling 
as Doc began sailing out of bounds over the baseline. And Landsberger, a solid leaper, skied and foreclosed the possibility of Doc sneaking a shot in this side of the basket, by which I mean dunking probably quite hard, by putting his hand against the backboard, a big door swinging shut. At which fine and commendable defensive effort, Irving simply decided in the air to knock on other doors by soaring more. Have you ever decided anything in the air? Turtling his head into his chest so as not to bash it against the backboard, flying like that, in fact, now behind the basket and backboard, where Kareem, a good help defender, mm, wait a sec, that's wrong. Kareem, one of the best defenders of all time, five-time NBA all-defensive first team, six-time NBA all-defensive second team, six MVPs, sorry, MJ, not to mention, which means it requires mentioning, Kareem was one of those Negroes they changed the rules for, banning the dunk for years from the NCAA, which is to say banning emphatic and exquisite flight, which maybe explains the wise and sort of tired eyes of Kareem, one of the best basketball players of all time, who had slid to also cut off the baseline, which he accomplished, but found himself now looking into the sky directly out of bounds which his own suddenly unfamiliar body must have been telling him was so weird. This is so weird. Looking and looking like this, his hands extended timidly, a silver maple's branches creaking and swaying in a hurricane. For Doc was amongst the trees, as we call the big man like Kareem, the trees, who reside mostly in the lane or in the key, growing there, rooting the thousands of fans now holding their breath, looking into the sky, some of their hands reaching out instinctively toward their neighbors beside them, or their palms instinctively laying on the shoulders before them, or forearms shoved gently into a wrist or hip beside them, a few arms of strangers suddenly locked as if going for a stroll. The whole of the spectrum become a kind of dew glistened web shivering its gems in the gales as, as Irving went higher and now began to extend his right hand in a precise arc beginning precisely above his head, painting a broad and precise circle, not unlike Leonardo's Vitruvian man in his hula hoop of perfect proportions. If that little naked man wasn't little or naked and was palming a basketball and was flying, and I find myself again and again with my arm making the perfectly impossible circle again and again as I watch this clip on YouTube frame by frame, clumsily on a computer with gummy keys and a post-it note covering the eye hole scrawled discipline on April 5th, 2015 at 1.48 a.m. again and again, thinking, what am I looking at? What am I seeing? Back to the first long step toward the baseline, the slight, slight contact with Landsberger, the leap again, long step, contact, leap again, long step, contact, leap again, long step, contact, leap. And I noticed this time in the background, which is granted hazy, this being old footage and my eyes a bit roomy for the now nearly two hours studying this clip, I noticed at about the foul line, Silk, AKA Jamal Wilkes, who for the record, Coach Wooden on the record said was his best player ever at UCLA. Not Kareem and no fuck forever, Bill Walton. And it's worthwhile to spend at least a moment with the name Silk, among the finest basketball nicknames implying an ease and fluidity of movement, implying a difficult thing, a painful thing made to look easy, a fiber prized for its softness, its smoothness on the skin, gathered from captive worms fed mulberry leaves. My court name was Beef, for what it's worth. And after a summer league game on the court at 10th and Lombard, where those in the know would slide through a gap in the grimace of the wrought iron gate to get in, a court that would be in time shut down in that most heinous 
of ways, removing the rims, the backboards lonely as gravestones. Because of complaints to the city from the condo owners across the street who did not want to hear, God forbid, all that Negro gathering and celebration and care and delight every goddamn weekend morning, all that frolic and tumult, all that flight. Why can't they just go someplace else? A slightly older opponent told me, holding my hand and shoulder and pulling me close, he was holding me beneath the stately oaks overhanging the court, looking kindly down on us and time to time blocking a high arcing shot and wishing a leaf or two upon the ex-ballers on the sidelines reading the Philadelphia Inquirer, sipping coffee, debating and laughing or acting stupid like refs making calls. Oh yeah, he walked his ass off. The oaks dappling the old heads in their discourse. The best line of verse I will ever write. His shirt soaked through, staring at me to be sure I was listening, which I was, then as now. You ain't no beast. You ain't no beast, you're a man. You hear me? I noticed Silk's right leg and hip twitch before relaxing with what might have been the body's, ah, oh, shit. Though if you look closely again and again in a certain kind of way, again and again, you'll see also what might be a kind of light descending upon Silk's high cheekbone, the forehead, on, in the forehead, again, and again, unfurling almost across his face as he cranes his neck toward the soaring. And you'd almost swear tonight at 2.26 a.m. he was looking into a tree strewn with people. The human shaped shadows twisting across his body, the legs swaying into his torso, a gray hand birding across his face, resting for a second at his ear. The pinky become a beak from which wheezed a tiny song. You'd swear, watching this sliver of the clip again and again, the shadow of one man's head seeming to lay itself on Silk's chest, for which, in the clip, you'll see Silk make of his arm a cradle, lowering his head as though to say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, with which the tree makes a kind of choir moaning, I'm so sorry twisting its roots in the molder with what they've been made to do. Wait, wait, what am I looking at? What am I practicing? It's not that, no, no, it's not that, it's late. My eyes are playing tricks for this tree is like the biggest uncle at the biggest family reunion holding in its flung open arms, nine guys, both raucous and wrapped, hollering and smacking hands and holding each other, cooing like lovebirds for the flight they're amidst in one of the house's best seats at Rucker Park in Harlem where the young as yet unpseudonymous Julius Irving, just a college kid from UMass, has begun his extended course of study on gravity and grace, which has so enthralled the throng, some kids scale the court's chain link fence looking like belly bared scarabs with bell bottoms and Chuck Taylors. And some peer from the bridge beyond, the traffic itself slowed and a couple hundred lounge precariously on ledges outside school windows, backpacks tucked in their laps or under their butts, one boy laying on his side with a small stack of school books wedged beneath his close shorn head, the algebraic equations tumbling into his ear as he looks drowsily down on the court and beyond from the ledge, his left arm dangling and casting slow eddies into the air. And do you know, while composing this, I almost dreamed some doom upon that child dozing beautifully in my poem, dreaming now above the flying. What am I looking at? What am I practicing? He sprawled there in the sun, easy as a lizard. I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna stop there. Jay, you wanna come on? Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like listening to you reading this and I'm up here trying to like carve out some like more notes beyond what I already had. <laughs> Man, thanks for this. This is this is incredible. Um, OK, like where do we start? Um, <laughs> maybe we start with um, 
And just say something about, you know, Philly in the court. I mean, yeah. just the, it's about Julius Irving and that, mm-hmm. that like famous layup. But inside of that, it's also about all this other kind of everyday court life. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So I'd love to hear something about that. And then, you know, if you can drop us inside of Philly, I mean, I, yeah. I'd love you to do that too. Cause yeah, um, yeah. I didn't know it that turns out we, we homeboys. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, so this, um, that, that moment in that court, um, I mean, you know, so this is a, it's a kind of an interesting poem to me because in way it's, it's, it's not about basketball, you know, mm-hmm. it's like in a lot of, you know, people, a friend of mine was like, oh, I'm just sad that you're not going to be like, you're not going to say anymore. I'm working on my Dr. J poem because uh-huh. I finished the Dr. J poem, uh-huh. <laughs> but uh but you know, it's it's like not about Dr. J. It's not mm-hmm. about basketball. But basketball is actually one of the subjects. And basketball, in as much I think as it's like a this site of social life that um, that is a, a kind of as I see it is a is a site of the practice of care. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think I mean the court. One of the courts that I'm talking about is is called Seeger Court, and it's on 10th and Lombard. And I was actually doing my PhD at Temple when I was living at like 11th and Lombard, so a block mm-hmm. away. Imagine my luck, you know. To mm-hmm. and that that just became my court and kind of where I grew up um, on on the court. Like I'm one of these people who became a better basketball player like after I got a little older. Um, but that that court and the game itself, you know, there's so much touch you know it's such a kind of um it's such a laboratory of touch you know and a laboratory of care as i see it and you know one of the things that i learned as an adult or became more attuned at witnessing i think as an adult were the ways that like you know at all the courts you know all the people in my life like part of the game of basketball is that you're you bring people with you and so like i can remember my coach Derek Derek williams when I was a kid and like learning how to play basketball, well, he was going to bring me along to play with some older guys in the, in the in YMCA league in Abington mm-hmm. and where I could go and get, you know, learn how to play basketball, but with some people who were <laughs> very good. <laughs> that was not, you know, <laughs> and so the court here, you know, it was a, the run, the, the game started at like eight in the morning, seven thirty on the weekend. And, you know, part of the job of the elders from the neighborhood, elders at that time, probably being 26, 27, was uh-huh. to scoop these little kids, you know, to scoop uh-huh. these little kids out of their places, and the high school kids, and be like, come on, we're going to the court. So dragging these little 16-year-old kids who are good basketball players, but like maybe didn't want to wake up at 7.30. And you just come on, now we're going to the court, you know? Um, so it's, it's such a kind of deep and abiding kind of, um, I mean, it, I feel like it's one of the places where I learned a lot more about how to play basketball, but I got better at seeing like what I've been doing as a as a thinker about basketball, but also as a participant in this game yeah. for most of my life, you know. And I love that it just struck me when you were saying like um, how the court like operates, because um, when I heard court, I, when you, I'm thinking basketball court, but when I heard court, yeah. I also defaulted to like the legal space of the court, right? Oh, yeah. And God, like, I never once thought of that there's this like alternative mode of law, right? Yeah. Um, you know, some of the people that we read talk about, you know, um, internal to black social life is its own kind yeah. of yours generative principles, right? Yeah. Law yeah. behind the mode of law as we know it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. The law of non-judgment. And then yeah. you're like kind of like schooled into, into like some, some, some other kind of like practices of of life together, right? And the, yeah. the court, the court is a declension from law, right? It exceeds yeah. and breaks law, even in the making of alternative modes of living and practicing. And that's like what you know, you land this out, and then all of that's happening right next to like Temple, right? Where right. I my undergrad. Yeah, yeah, so you, yeah. You up in North Philly, and you know, um, there's this alternative education that's happening on an alternative court. Right. right. And all, right. all of this, these practices of, of sociality that are happening there. Right. You know, it's, I, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's amazing that <laughs> <laughs> I have never thought of 
uh, of uh, the court and the court. It's, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm writing about basketball a lot these days, and I've uh -huh. never thought of the court and the court right. um, being the same thing. And one of the things that I often think of, and this, I, like, I feel like I learned from the writer John Edgar Wideman, mm -hmm. um, his book, his book Hoop Roots, is just like, right. you know, one of the best books on sport, et cetera, it's incredible. on basketball. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, the court, it's, it's a constant negotiation. The rules are not set. Like, you might know that something-ish is a foul, mm -hmm. but different people have a different relationship to that. Like, some people never call fouls. Like, actually, that was my problem, and that's why they called me beast. So, you know, and that was like, <laughs> and that was like, and then some people call fouls a lot. And like, mm -hmm. all these ways that you kind of negotiate what are the approximate rules of the game so that it's actually a, every second it's a negotiation like oh that's a walk no it's not a walk like right. and we're gonna like figure this out together right right yeah. right yeah that's that yeah that's that's what i'm hearing you like kind of lay out how that how that sociality works and that the, the it's, it's it's both basketball but it's more than basketball right? yeah yeah um yeah yeah I, i'm i'm digging it a lot and it, this whole this um kind of like I, I was thinking about how flight like kind of works in, yeah. in all this and maybe flight you know you know has something to do with what we're talking about right now right yeah. this constant negotiation is a part of the practice of flying right part of uh -huh. the practice of flight itself yeah. now, i wonder if you, you you could you know maybe say a little bit more about about how flight works here i mean because there's this there's a sense in which it's what kind of propels this, this the story here or which are kind of poeticizing is this moment where uh, Dr. J is in flight, right? Yeah. And he's in flight without any sense of whether or not what he's flying towards and what he's, his objective is gonna work, right? So the flight is an experiment, right? The flight is an, ex that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's like the, you know, so one of the things I think is kind of neat, before I read Christina Sharp's book, um, In mm -hmm. the Wake, this book was called Flight. Ah. Uh, you know, and I, <laughs> and I read her book and I was like, oh yeah. I'm also talking about beholden and the beholden. Um, but the book was called Flight um, in part because I was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about this move. I was thinking about like the, the sort of imagination, you know, Dr. J's move as a kind of like deciding something in the air. Mm -hmm. and he has to decide something while in suspension. Yeah. Um, and you can't, you know, it's not like a, there's not like a reliable set of things that he's gonna, he's drawing on. He's having to like, all right, well, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Right. You know, and amidst this sort of like, it is kind of amazing to me that the move becomes even more beautiful because he's doing it against one of the most beautiful, one of the best basketball players ever to play the game. Cause Kareem right. is right there. Who's also like effectively invented, you know, he's had to like crack mm -hmm. all of this other, you know, basketball life out of his own imagination. Right. And so Doc sort of be doing that in the midst of like this other, you know, genius. It's just like, you know, kind of amazing. But I actually, Jay, I actually want to read this, like this page, um, uh -huh. if I can. Yeah, please. Because, because there's this other, when you were saying that about flight, I was thinking, um, there are all these sort of resonances of flight, like like um, flying, jumping, Dr. Mm -hmm. J, imaginative flight, um, flight like the flying Igbo, the flying Africans, yes. um, and then then um, then my great grandfather comes into this poem, mm -hmm. um, and he's like, you know, there's a sort of story in my in my family that my great grandfather had to had to leave like a lot of our great grand people had to leave um and this and it's a flight it's another kind of flight um, um my great grandfather as a young man a sharecropper in osceola arkansas with hands like a hummingbird's who could fill his sacks kind of quick plus a bit more to sell on the side which in the parlance of the day the same parlance as ours, incidentally, in which you can own stolen land, in which you can become very wealthy owning stolen land, which all owned land is, stolen goods, hot, hot goods, the hot earth, which earth has been bequeathed as property, as heritable wealth, 
though the meek shall first inherit the heap. But the land, the cotton, the unshared crop, let's hereon call it what it is, loot, plain and simple, which to my great grandfather's body was loot, and his life loot. His life was theirs like the crop, like the land, they could be, they have been thrown overboard for the insurance, breathe, let's breathe. It was theft, which is to say it was his life he was stealing, steal away, steal away, and caught my great grandfather was made to quickly theorize both flight and disappearance by carving with a sickle a crude window into a man who mistook him for a door he could open and close at will. Yes, we come from poet, steal away. And he steps through that window by sitting on the sill and first lifting his one leg into his chest and like that looked for a moment as though he was resting, how I wish he could rest, as though he was just a young man enjoying the day, looking upon the family of oaks near the road, their limbs always like arms to him, the shadows of leaves cast in the long grass like thousands and thousands of perched birds watching, closing his eyes and breathing in the gentle breeze slowly circling and gathering in little eddies at his neck, which he was not because he could be killed for anything, anything. But he did look quickly behind him into this rotten house, the beams sagging with must, the plaster dropping in sticky flakes of flesh before twisting his name, Frank Jennings, into a wick he lit and tossed burning inside the house while pulling his other leg through gathering up what had just been cargo, what had just been loot, thrown overboard for the insurance. Breathe, breathe. His body, his life, gathering himself up in his thin arms, turning toward the unknown and stealing away. Mm. That's a little bit just what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's so cool. And that's another thing I love about the poem, right? It's got these... It's got these valences where, in effect, I mean, in hearing you read that beautiful kind of moment about your grandfather, he's like this basketball player, mm. right? He's, uh, you know, or another way to put it is, is that Dr. J um, in that kind of, uh, uh, that experiment of the layup being defended yeah. by Kareem and the other yeah. player, that they are in the genealogy of your grandfather right that's it your yeah. grandfather is, is is a court player right so it, yeah. it, i mean this is where it's both about the basketball moment of dr j but it's way more than about <laughs> right black folk been basketball players which right. is the, they be they've been in flight they they're yeah. on the court but they're like ungrounded from the court yeah. they're always jumping yeah. off the ground right yeah and so yeah. The, the court becomes this kind of um this kind of ungrounded space you know, in the broader space of a territory that's been looted. Right. 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 And so it's, I mean, I just find it just absolutely like fascinating about how, you know, Dr. J's story there is, it both holds within it to play with this notion right. of whole, behold, yeah. it holds yeah. within it this long kind of um, untellable, um, but nevertheless must be told history. Right of black folk in flight, right? And he's right, like almost like right. performing that that tradition of yeah. of black leaping. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that that um exceeding exceeding the court, like <laughs> mm -hmm. that's still kind of amazing to me. That that his flight itself, I mean Dr. J, he doesn't quite fall out fly out of bounds, but he almost flies out of bounds, which my buddy Scott was like, out of bounds is like out of bondage. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess that's part of like what makes the fact that you meditated on that, and it does connect with your grandfather, which is to say it does connect with the impossible possibility of black endurance. Yeah. You know, yeah. In this vast scene of subjection, as right. Harvey might put it, that is the modern world, that is America and the Americas. The amazing thing is, is that we're on the court. And we're always operating out of bounds, right? Yeah. That the layup is virtually impossible, right? It, this is a move. Yeah. I mean, we were talking yeah. about it, you know, yeah. what, yesterday. <laughs> and I really want yeah. you to say something about this about, yeah. you know, it's my mistake. 
And it was a kind of cool, productive, and generative mistake. So I completely yeah, yeah, yeah. own it. Is that when I was first, it didn't, I knew it, but it didn't like dawn on me like the, 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 the incredible move of Dr. J is not the incredible dunk of Dr. J. Right, right. right. It's, the, it's the impossible layup. He's, yeah, he's yeah. out of bounds and inbounds at the same time. Yeah, he's yeah. under the court, out of the range of the court, defended yeah. from, or at least the hoop. He's defended from, yeah. and he, he's got to become a bodily contortionist to pull this. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a feat of the impossible, and I almost want to, Wish I could write it <laughs> to just like grab yeah. it or you know, like say how I'm thinking it. It's a feat yeah. of the M I M slash possible, right? Mm -hmm. That possibility mm -hmm. is always it's 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 working through the sinews of our, of, of our impossible con circumstance, right? Yeah. But yeah. the layup, man, it's the layup, not the dunk, man. Would you say yeah. something about that? Well, yeah, I, I agree. Like that that conversation last um, last night about this, that the dunk is like a kind of it's emphatic. It's like it's not. It's not infused actually with doubt and precarity, right? But the layup, you know, even like you know, like when you shoot a layup, um, um, you know, like depending on the layup and the layup that Dr. J shot in this case, like he had to, like he all these things that he had to do, and like I implore anyone who has not looked at this um, mm -hmm. move, look at it. And look at it in slow motion, like one thousand times for four years, and <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. and you'll and you'll notice that Doc flies out of bounds, and in order to make this move, he actually he has to duck his head beneath because his head was going to hit the backboard. Mm -hmm. So you know, but additionally, like the way that he spins the ball, he's you know he's almost on the ground. You know, I mean he's reaching so far, and he spins the ball, and the ball, the ball, you know they. It's called English, you know, when you spin the ball and it kind of goes in, but mm -hmm. it's also called kissing. You know, he kissed it off the backboard. Yes, that's right. And it's like, and that's what layups, um, you know, different kinds of shots, but a, lay a dunk does not require any, <laughs> actually it doesn't require any kissing. Right. And maybe you could kind of be like the sort of vulnerability actually of the kiss too. Mm -hmm. But the layup, the layup requires that kind of you know it's not just it's not just a direct move it's a move that requires a collaboration actually also with the glass you know yeah man see all right now you as they say <laughs> i hope i can say this <laughs> but now you're fucking with me right <laughs> because i mean it's so much going on with that and i'm like oh my god so i like i wrote down three things because like the way you just like kind of described all that it, there's a deep choreography going on right yeah. a kind of there's, there's the choreography of blackness that's happening here right a kind of impossible movement that um is nevertheless performed right mm -hmm. so there's the choreography and then it made me think of you know close to choreography made me think of dance mm -hmm. right there's a there's a kind of um dancing in flight that's happening that allows this also to happen and then you really mess me up when you talk because you remind me. It's like, yeah, they, that's what they call it. It's like kissing off the backboard, but yeah, yeah. which then brings in both how the 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 the, the material object of the backboard mm -hmm. is in collaboration with that movement, right? Yeah. Which which then takes away the way often we want to read Dr. J in these kind of heroic terms. Mm -hmm. where in mm -hmm. fact, you know this this. The, I mean, he, he's a genius. I'm not trying to take anything, but the condition yeah. of the, the condition through which that genius articulates itself is through this collaboration with the court itself, with the hoop, with the backboard. A collaboration that you call kissing. It reminded me that you yeah. know, kissing at the backboard. But of course, when you think of kissing. I mean, and what the dunk doesn't do, the dunk doesn't kiss, right? No, it, it, no. it forces, right, or something yeah. like this. Yeah. But the kissing yeah. then suggests like a kind of both the collaboration, but also then invites a kind of um, a, a kind of both the erotic, but also the kinetic. I, I mean, yeah. I'm really, yeah. I find all yeah. of that just absolutely like, it's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that yeah, you yeah, like yeah. built a poem out of that. I'm just like, see, this is why I read poets. I'm not sure I can be <laughs> one. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I that, guess, yeah, I'm taken aback by all of this. I mean, yeah, would you say something about that? Especially, you know, the, the, the sociality of this, of this, 
of, of the event. And I, and I use that word event intentionally, right? That, mm -hmm. that was an event, a kind of social eruption um, yeah. into how we think about the order of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that sort of, um, you know, the erotics, I think of um, the way Audre Lorde talks about the erotics mm -hmm. um, as a kind of presence, you know, mm -hmm. and attention. Um, um, but I also think what is, yeah, I mean, what's so interesting about this, this, uh, what you're saying, and also like the idea that Dr. J is not like a, he is not a singular heroic figure, you know, mm -hmm. he's someone who I love as a basketball player, you know, and he figures ma in, big in my imagination, but Dr. J. It, it's almost like whole, you really, it's almost like you're really not from Philly if you don't love Dr. J. Right. I know, I know, you're, I know. You're, you're two signs that you're not from Philly. <laughs> Philadelphia and not Philly. You're not Philly. <laughs> <laughs> And the other one is you don't love Dr. J. It's like, okay, yeah, you're not from bad. Philly. Goodbye. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the, the um, so much of what's happening in the poem is all this looking, all this mm -hmm. looking at each other and seeing and like, what's he looking at? What are they looking at? What am I looking at? And I think one of the things, or I wonder um, that, I think one of the arguments maybe that that, or one of the questions that's raising is something about like the deeply collaborative, some kind of mutual, some kind of co-creative thing that, that, that he's coming out of, you know, or even that, that we come out of and that we are in, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I don't have this totally like locked up in my head or formulated, but, like I, I've been thinking quite a bit about all of the looking in the poem. Um, you know, one thing I'll just say too, I said it to you last night, but like the, you know, when you write a poem over the course, a 90, 50, 90 or 95, whatever page poem over the course of five years, um, it, it's such a pleasure because you're always, I am, I'm feeling this so far, which is why I feel so lucky to have this conversation mm -hmm. with you. I'm like, well, what, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what's happening here? But one of the things all that looking is doing is that I think it's sort of asking the question of like, how, how, how do we see each other into being, you know, or how do we see each other into possibility? And how Dr. J, like you said it, I mean, I hadn't thought of it exactly like this, or not even close to like this, but that, that my grand, great grandfather in some way is a of course, he's a forebear to that feat of the imagination that Dr. J is doing. Of course yeah. he is. Uh, but I hadn't thought of it. But when you say it, it's like, oh, right. Like there are these lineages that, that probably run in multiple directions. But like, mm -hmm. and once you kind of dial into that, it's like, well, he's, it's not, he's not the only one doing this. He's right. not, it's not just Doc doing this, you know. It's, right. And we're doing it by witnessing it. We're doing the flight by witnessing it. And there is this moment in the poem and I didn't realize and someone brought it up like that when I'm, when I'm talking about Doc doing that move and I sort of had that little funny move where I'm saying the, he's like Leonardo's Vitruvian man like in that mm -hmm. hula hoop of perfect proportions. And that it's, and it's true. Like I was describing the feeling that I was having when I was watching it is that I was watching it and I was, my body was becoming the thing that I was watching, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, in addition to the sort of possibilities that, of witness that that mm -hmm. suggests um, and the bountiful or aviary, you know, like yeah. flight, um, survival, it, I think it also just asks the question generally of like, how does our witness sort of make our bodies? How do yes. our bodies get carried by and sometimes not, you know, right. carried under by our witness. Or in some sense, how it like, how, how it, how we are moved into a different kind of, um, almost like physics of the flesh or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because yeah. like, <laughs> sort of, our, sort of like what the, the notion of the body tends to be kind of invested in is in this kind of well-contained comportment but yeah. it's uh, uh, Dr. J's body. It's you know he's been yeah. he he's undergoing like a kind of contortion, right? Yeah. Um, and then we contort with that contortion in in like yeah. kind of we too. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, I'm thinking about all of that. And then you actually just had this interesting formulation. I don't know how you, at least the way I heard it, when you talk about we're, we're, we're caught up in it um, as we're watching it. Yeah. And which then means that, you know, even in this conversation, we be, we, we, we're, we're playing basketball. Right. Yeah. We're, we're in the yeah. play of it all. Right. Yeah. Those who yeah. are observing this conversation are drawn into the into the into the play of it all. Right. And so right. The, the, the game never ceases. Right. Yeah. We're, we're constantly yeah. um, in this kind of contortioned movement of flesh. Right. Together. Right? Flesh right. as right. a togetherness. That's precisely what right. it is. Right. 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 Which, right. which is quite different from if you want to like maybe think about um, technically the notion of a self-composed and self-determined body if not body politic mm -hmm. this this is something yeah. different um yeah. I, i'm wondering before we get to the to the to the uh, other people jumping in uh, a couple more things i'd love to ask you about yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and two in particular another one may emerge afterward but two in particular comes about one is i am very interested in the multiple valences and i think we've already touched upon this through our conversation but the multiple valences of the title of the book mm -hmm be holding right and even the yeah. way that it's it's written on the book um you know be I'll hold the cover up here would be and then yeah holding you know the, the b yeah. the, the two color differentials mm -hmm. the, the word is one and yet it's 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 um it's broken mm -hmm. <laughs> right it's it's it's, mm -hmm. it's one but it's also um serrated it's cut yeah um yeah between being um, or be a, a kind of condition, a state. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at one point you said how we see each other into being, right? Beholding, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, our, our existence is, is in some sense, it's, it's given to us in the communion of having been seen in a certain way. Yeah. And then yeah. the holding, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and that holding plays on a number of valences. I mean, we are the people right. who were once held, right? Yeah. You talked about yeah. property, you know, with your story right. of your grandfather. Yeah. We were the ones who were once held. Um, our yeah. condition was the condition of the dispossessed. And right. yet there's some other kind of mode of being here that has something to do with the holding, but it's not in the register of possession, possessing. Yeah. It's a yeah, holding yeah. without grasping, a holding without <clears throat> Right, a yeah. holding that is a kind of caring, a kind of caressing, um, right. a kind of communioning or something. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, I, is there? I, I, is there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the yeah, that's like one of the one of the questions. Is there a kind of witnessing that constitutes a holding? Mm -hmm. You know, and how do we be? In, or and is there a kind of holding? Um, is there a kind of holding that renovates our looking? You mm -hmm. know, something like that yeah um and and that um but yeah i mean the the you know it's a it can kind of be like a declaration like be holding you know mm -hmm. be, if, what what should you be doing be holding that's a thing mm -hmm. you know um mm -hmm. like be caring be reaching be offering be mm -hmm. you know um but it is like it, at the very least it's sort of trying to sort of get into the idea of like how i think i think it's like the the ways that looking can constitute, uh, like like we were saying last night, like not not a seizure, because there's a kind of beholding that can constitute like a capture. Mm -hmm. You know, often you say like about there's a lot of pictures in this book for people who haven't seen it, um, and the, the language of photography is often the language language of like acquisition or you know right. capture or shot or shot you know like violent language, right. um, and I think this this poem repeatedly is sort of it's also like witnessing trying to study like these sites where you maybe didn't see it but you were held i didn't see it but when i'm dancing with my buddy and i can't and i keep falling because i can't do that move that he can uh -huh. do <laughs> like you know a real good cabbage patch plus you know and, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> cabbage patch plus <laughs> yeah would be like there, there, yeah. he was like very <laughs> centripetal, you know. <laughs> he can like spin to the ground and like mm -hmm. come up, and I'm like, man, I try it, and I'd like fall. He's like, help me, and kind of catch mm -hmm. me and hold me and pick me back up. And it's like this 
all of these sites, the court is another one, of course. And like, you know, when the dude is like the, the elder, he was probably 35. I'm 45 now. He was 35. I was probably 25. And he's like, uh -huh. you ain't no beast. You ain't no beast. Uh -huh. You're a man. But he was holding me when he was saying that, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't locking me. He wasn't like uh -huh. keeping me from anything. He was sort of like holding me in a way that was sort of like, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a kind of like a, I always mix up ontological and epistemological. I can't get those things straight in my head, but it's a kind of, <laughs> he was sort of like doing a, it was a, the, the be holding, like he was sort of offering me a kind of way of being, you know, or he, that holding to me suggested a way of being, you know, and yes. it was a way of looking too. It was a way of looking that was a holding, you know? Um, and the poem, the whole way through is kind of like, what are the ways that, how are the ways that we witness either holdings or something else, you know? Yeah. I'm interested, you know, obviously like I'm interested in the ways that we witness that do constitute a holding in the way that we're talking about, you know? Yes. I want to study that, you know, I want to study that and I want to sort of cultivate and practice that, you know, practice, we talk about practice. Yes. Yeah, we talk about yeah. practice. Yeah, 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 that is so good, so good. Yeah, I'm digging it. I, and that's because I'm feeling all of those, those, those valences. Of, of beholding there that yeah. there's a shifting of, of the sensorium that is happening here. There's a shifting, yeah. I mean, our ways of looking, of um, certainly looking, but our, let's just stay with looking, our ways of looking yeah. need to be in some sense um, subjected to a kind of new tutelage or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you're like kind of walking us through that, but that re-tutelage of, of sight, it's also like shifting our way of existing, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's shifting it and it's also summoning it. Um, mm -hmm. And I hear that in the story of, you know, when the elder, you know, puts his arm around you and say, yeah. you're not a beast, you're, I mean, yeah. you're a man. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and yet it's, at least the way in which I wanna hear it, it's, it's mm -hmm. not the manhood of the normative order of things, right? No. Um, no. Spillers might call it an ungendered manhood, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. manhood ungendered yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, which then actually brings me at least to uh, an invitation for you to talk about this cover. Mm. I mean, because yeah. you know, basketball is this kind of you know, I, you know, notwithstanding the um, the WNBA, but yeah. you know, basketball in the court, you know, um, on, on, on a tenth of Lombard. Mm -hmm. um, or, or the courts I used to hang out at, yeah. they tended to be these masculine spaces, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the care and the tenderness that you're talking about, that's not the way we often think about yeah. sport, let alone basketball. Yep. And yep. I'm wondering about this image on the front and yeah. how already right there, it's inviting, it's upending our, our expectations of how this meditation on basketball is going to work. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because, in a way, it's kind of like the obvious. The obvious cover for the book was the picture mm -hmm. of Doc. You know, right. like that's the obvious cover. But when I found this picture, which is, you know, like, um, let me just show the picture of Doc, the aerial view, anyway, so people can people can see it. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing <laughs> photo. <laughs> hey, goodness. Um, but when I, I was, I was actually looking, um, I went to the WPA um, photos at the Library mm -hmm. of Congress. I was going through the files and I was looking to see if I could find something from um, Arkansas. I wanted to kind of see like what it would look like where my great grandfather would have fled from. Mm -hmm. and, and I just stumbled upon this photograph. And like I said, at that time, this was like 2016 maybe, at that time, this, this poem was still called Flight. And I didn't know what it was. Yeah, I mean, it was it was like a maybe a third of the way done. You know, maybe I had the first part done. Mm -hmm. And um, then I came upon this photograph and I sort of, this little boy has the, it's called a Lindy cap, I've heard it called. Yeah. Like a kind of a, an aviator's cap. A aviator's, right. Yeah, and I and his grandmother, his grandmother, um, kind of standing next to him, um, and I kind of meditate on 
you know, what she might be. I meditate and, you know, sort of like in a loose way on what she might be thinking with her little kid there um, um, with his cap and, and that, that he has a, he has the dream of flight on his head. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the, the question that I keep kind of going back to through this is like, who put the dream of flight on the child's head? Right. You know, it was it was the grandmother. It was, you know, in the in the in the in my sort of Mm -hmm. speculation, the grandmother put the dream of flight on the child's head. Um, But it just I mean, this is the turn the thinking about this child with uh, with the the flight, the aviator's cap and his sort of like incredibly soft, dreamy face. You know, (laughs) he's such a beautiful little kid. And what he's holding in his hand and and that he's being looked at as well. Mm-hmm. That he's being looked at. Um, you know, one thing I, I think it's interesting and important to say for folks who I don't know if anyone like does research, like maybe whatever, it this became the central thing. This became the turn of the poem. I wasn't looking for this. I uh-huh. found it. I just kind of luckily found it. And and yet this was the thing that the poem was needing, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, but yeah, what do you see in that photograph when you look man, at it? Man, I love this, and I should say yeah. even before I comment on what I'm getting ready to say about this photo, I just think there's a po a poetics and a poem of the photograph in this book. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I mean, so like if you like kind of back away from the poem as compilation of words, Mm -hmm. shall we say, and read it as poem as compilation of photographs. Mm -hmm. It becomes like a, there's another, Mm -hmm. I think in accord with what you're saying, there's there's another poem also being articulated, Mm -hmm. right? You Mm -hmm. begin with the the shot of Doc from that end. Then the next photo I believe is of a hand on the rocks, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then um, um, another one with the hand on the rocks. Then I think the next photo is the one you just showed. Yeah. The, the kind of aerial look down on the yep. show, right? Yeah. And then something happens. That's when we get the photo that's on the front of the book here. Yep. And then we conclude with this photo of joy of these two women yeah. Yeah. going there. Yeah. And I take all of those as scenes of the, of the basketball court, <laughs> every last mm-hmm. one, right? Mm-hmm. And this one in particular, which is like kind of, you know, kind of turns to, to another vector in the book. I mean, I take it that, you know, this scene from down south, um, this, 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 this kind of cabin home of, um, that seems to register um, a kind of poverty. In the wider picture, you can see the clothes that are a bit tattered and torn. Mm-hmm. Um, they're looking at, you know, I, I sort of see this as this kind of, uh, this moment of the photograph, uh, this moment of the court as well, right? Mm-hmm. In which um, mm-hmm. this young boy is undergoing a certain, ki- has undergone a certain kind of tutelage towards flight. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, yes. And you know where I'm going with it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm a reader yeah. of fillers and a black feminist yeah. thought, and I sort of see this, this emerging basketball player with the, with the goggles of flight on his head um, as a mama's baby. Yeah. Right. Mm, you know, mm. um, and and the, the order of the regime of the, the masculine sovereign, yeah. that mode of the basketball player is actually displaced to give another kind of, pre- to a kind of preparatory kind mm. of state for this young boy into a mm. different kind of um, you know, as I said earlier, let me like some sort of ungendered masculinity having been touched yeah. by the mother. And then yeah. at the very end, the kind of sociality of these of these these young women here right. is like right. the sociality of the court, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, mm-hmm. it echoes back on Dr. J. It echoes back on that moment of them going under the court where yeah. I want to read them in this tradition, actually, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the figure of the black feminine as the one who 
not only is property, but as it were through, um, what is it, partis um, patri ventrum, and whether the Latin mm -hmm. formulation, the condition right. of the child follows that of the mother. She's not right. only property, but she breeds property, right? Right. Spiller right. says there's an alternative sociality going on there. And I, I sort of want to read the court through the through the series of the photos as, a, as themselves yeah. a poem. Yeah, and yeah. it's kind of like turning the tables, right? Upending right. the whole notion of the court. Right. There's, a, there's another sociality happening here. Um, right. Sometimes I call it kind of black churchicality, right? There's yeah, an yeah. alternative sacrality that's going on there from the condition of a of black of black flight, black choreographic flight. Right. And that, that's right. how I want to like kind of like read the book. And I, I mean, on page ninety three, you got these lines right around the photo of the yeah. two, of the two women with you know exuding this joy, walking towards yeah. the photograph. Yeah. Say, um, let's see, um, tensed as though in movement because she is running toward the camera. She is being moved by the looking, toward the looking, her right hand nearly a fist and shouting at the looking, at the person behind the camera. There are flowers growing on her shirt, vining from her hip, nearly to her clavicle. It is wisteria and clematis, if I'm saying that word right, a swirl of pollinating creatures. I mean, <laughs> this is a scene of generativity, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Otherwise life is, right. uh, is flourishing um, beyond simply being manicured on the proper yeah. family lawn or something like that. Right, but, right, right. But it's, it's the flourishing of these, of these women, of these, you know, and that, that reverberates in a kind of backward kind of sense throughout the whole poem, inviting me yeah. now to read it forward right. towards the, that kind of black feminine direction or something. Right, right. And when you now, say you all signal that- it on, You signal it right on the, the cover of the book. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. And it's sort of like, it makes me think, oh, right. And the, the court, again, you know, this is like <laughs> such a gift to me. But the court, the multiple valences of the court and what, what, what beautifully disrupts the court, except that looking at the end there. Yes. Yeah. Except that look, that looking at the end there is like, then. Yes. Yes. Well, we could keep talking, but I suppose we better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. let get in on the joy and the fun. <laughs> Let me say too, because I maybe folks have already written um, questions, but um, questions for both of us. You know, if you have a question just for Jay, like that's fine. So whatever, um, mm -hmm. and we might just volley anyway. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Um, that was absolutely amazing to listen to, um, and I think that there's general consensus on that. I do want to say that um, at some point while you were talking in the past few minutes the Facebook feed froze for a few moments. It uh, continued okay. fine on Zoom. So, and the conversation, and I wanna let the audience know that the conversation continued throughout. So for anybody okay. who'd like to catch up on, um, on the, the, the few moments that they missed, we will be posting the recording on Facebook um, within the next day or two probably. So you can return and see it. So I just wanted to make, put that out there. So. I, I, I just wanna say that I really loved how you exploded the possibility of words with their polyvalence, whether it was scenes and seen um, and not being seen. Um, um, and then the question of the, the, the court and be, be holding and beholding and flight and how they all ripple into one another and challenge each other. Um, so, I mean, that, was incredibly uh, moving to me. We have thus far a question, two questions from Sarah Knott. The first is, um, what is the date of the photograph? And the second is, can you say more about why the poem needed, in quotes, the photograph? I am so curious, especially the figure of the child. I've noticed how often you portray children and with such tenderness. Mm. Um. Let me see that if I can find the date of the photograph. I think I can. Um, no, it doesn't have the date, but the title says, this Negro woman lives with her husband and two grandchildren in an old converted schoolhouse. Uh, 
Mm. Um, the rest of her children have left the county, Heard County, Georgia, Georgia. Um, it doesn't have a date though, uh, but it's from a, it's a WPA photo. Oh, you know what? On the photograph itself, it might have had the date, um, but I can't remember. But Sarah, in answer to your question, I'm just going to read a little bit of um, why I had to need that, why I needed that child in there. I mean, you know, I need that photograph. It, there were so many things, so many questions about, about, um, I guess about the poem, sort of what Jay, what Jay sort of like helped mm. me see that I had not yet put language to is, is part of it. Part of it is it, it became a way for me to think probably about um, my mother as well. My mother arrives in the poem um, by thinking about this photograph. Mm -hmm. And it also is a way that my father arrives through this poem in some way that kid in some way, I think he, he becomes my great grandfather, but he also in a way becomes my, my dad who was, you know, in a kind of a meditation on citizenship because my dad was a, um, you know, was a, a a meteor on a meteorology team, uh, mm -hmm. something called the Hundred Knotters. So he was in airplanes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and but the the question with the boy is like that kid. He, I'm just going to read a couple, two pages or something. But by enlarging the boy until he fills fills the field of my vision, I can see in his hand is an origami bird he has made and on which he might with his left hand be putting the finishing touches to the beak that the bird might better lullaby mm. the wings folded lightly against his fingers the bird's sharp head twisted back toward the child looking into his dream of the sky but the bird also cranes her little paper neck back in the direction of the grandmother who the more i study her despite what I said before, moving her eyes as close to me as they will come, moving mine as close to her as they will go, seems to be, it is true, looking into the sky beyond. Look, you know, Jay, it's like, um, I'm writing right now about my father's relationship to his grandmother, Biggie, um, uh, Nellie McKay, um, mm. Sophia Farouk, she had a couple names and like, um and there one of my questions in this poem actually was um i was <laughs> i can't even get it but that is just like you just touched something <laughs> that's really mm -hmm. you found something that i think i've been looking for looking into the sky beyond looking into the sky beyond the photographer taking the picture taking her boy and bringing the child as close to us as possible the little galaxies of light lustering his beautiful brown skin his lower lip and nose, if we bring him so close to us, we can hear him breathing. The soft eddying of wind into his nose and closer still until his lungs become kites. Let's make them today of newspaper dyed purple and flesh with peonies and pokeberries and the black walnut husks soothing and rainwater out back. Let's make them today with gold smudges of dandelion lighting the diamond of newsprint framed with four sinewy sticks of dogwood so that as the kites fledge into the sky above the sunflower field in the boy's body, they look like hands greeting us. They look like all the beloved hands who have ferried that child forth, beckoning us into the precious sky inside the child. Mm. You know, that's yeah. that's kind of why that photograph and you know that part of the poem i'm in this deep conversation with this um book called the black maria by Adeseli skirmai um and and she's writing about um she's writing about many things but i'm in i'm in conversation with her and this poem this that moment in the poem and that photograph is in conversation with some of the looking um some of the tending and the care that she's doing. But I feel like, I feel like, I don't know how to answer that question any more than like that. That's why I needed that. That's why the poem needed that photograph, you know? Mm -hmm. That child was beckoning me, was beckoning me. Yeah. Yeah. Would, would you maybe also speak a little bit about, um, 
how you um, in, how you work on um, and represent the figure of children in your work el elsewhere? It's interesting you say, like I, I never thought of it as like a thing, but when you say it, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess um, maybe I do. <laughs> um, I mean, I wonder what that is, you know, in that, in that instance, I'm thinking so much about um i guess i'm thinking about so much but i'm thinking in some way of my own young self i'm thinking about my beloved's children i'm thinking about my father as a child i'm thinking about my father and his grandmother i'm thinking about um you know my elder my great-grandfather um and i suspect maybe i'm thinking of you know there's some way of thinking of children in the context of this poem that the tenderness and the sort of care that is obviously a you know a, a requirement you'd imagine um maybe maybe puts me someplace you know maybe that's sort of what what is what is happening but you know like i don't i don't know if i could answer the question about the whole i have to think more about that but um there's 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 actually quite a few children in this poem. Um, mm -hmm. There's quite a few children in this poem. And I think, um, I think part of the, I, I don't quite know how to articulate this, but I think part of the question of flight becomes more potent with, um, with kids, you know, and I don't, and I don't know, um, I don't know. Jay, when you hear that, what do you, do you have, are you thinking anything? <laughs> yeah, I'm just listening to you and just taking this in. Um, I mean, when I look at the child here, and again, this is re reverberating off of other stuff I've been reading lately, but when I look at the child here, and then you bring in out, I think that what's in the child's hand is origami. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the child's playing on some yeah. level. There's a both playing, but also creating. Yeah. In, in, in the, there's a handiwork that's happening here. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. maybe a basketball in Nuche or something. Right, right. But I sort of think about an, a, a kind of alternative futurity, right? Mm -hmm. The possibility through the child of thinking of future that can break from the future that would destine towards a violence. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a curious thing. This is a black child, right? And when you, we know the world we live in, and when you think about a black child, I mean, <laughs> it's almost as if they, they, are, they are already positioned at the horizon of death. Right, right, right. And yet, there's some something else going on here and that yeah, the yeah. fact that you can imagine a black child is yeah, itself yeah. like a kind of impossible layup right 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 and i think that's how i'm like kind of reading this and if you yeah. read it that way i mean there's a line from that child then to to the play of dr j to the to the play of the court um but it's conditioned by this onlooking of, of this grandmother and it just struck me I didn't see it before I'm just literally like whoa I didn't see that I'm looking at the image there's a person a figure in back of the grandmother that's like yeah. peering over her shoulder yeah. you know it, it's like <laughs> I mean this is a scene of, of a sociality of impossible sociality you know yeah. at, at an abandoned site of, of learning um, the, the abandoned site of schooling you know, right. another schooling is taken up there and the child indexes a future, an impossible future coming out of that. Right. That's, yeah, that's part of the thing. I'm like, um, like in the, you know, that child and that grandmother are imagining the future. Yes. Right. And that's, like that's the, and it's yeah. like through the, through the, through the photograph, you are, the viewer is summoned into that future. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the summoning is producing us into that future. I mean, this is where the yeah. beholding yeah. I think becomes really, really interesting. We we are we are seen, which is to say, summoned through the photograph into an into an into a future that is um <laughs> photographically unhinged from the from the unfolding right. present. Right. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a breakdown of the now. Right. In, in the name of what surges through that now. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. And, I, and when when Dr. J's in flight, and when this young lad here with his flight, you know, equipment on, I mean that, that this is an insurgent act. It's almost yeah. I mean, I would even go so far. This is this is me. I would call it a. It's an abolitionist practice, mm -hmm. right? It's trying to mm -hmm. abolish and break down the now, in yeah. the name of what the now could never imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the the grandmother looking and being like what are you looking at yeah <laughs> the, the refusal and the refusal is like you you're not seeing what i'm seeing what i'm saying right. is i put the hat on his head yes you know there's the flight i put yeah. the hat on his head you know yeah. we put the hat on his head in, in yeah. this case it's not just about um it's not just about the, the 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 child and the representation of the figure of the child it's the representation of the figure of the child in relationship to uh his forebears um it's a, so it's an intergenerational thing which you also reference when you're talking um about how you were mentored on the court uh, mm -hmm. this is how you are to be or this is how, this is who you are yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, I, I, I mean, Deb, I think that's, I love that comment. I really, really love that. I mean, the more and more I keep looking at this image on the front and, and processing it along with what you just said, I mean, it's, it's powerful. I mean, you know, they, they, are, they are emanations of a cavernous blackness, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, yeah. stand, they stand at the portal of, an, of a vast opening, but the opening is like a kind of it's like a kind of black void of infinite possibility with, with almost like a kind of ancestral figure looking over the shoulder of the grandmother <laughs> as yeah. well. It's, yeah. it's, it's profound. I mean, and the, the, the child is, I mean, uh, I don't know, Deb, you just said it much better than me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher it and mess it up, but the, the child must under, be understood as the locus of a relation, right? A kind of nodal point within, a, within an infinite kind of really? canvas of, re, of relationality. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, the, and the blackness that like is the backdrop of the child it is the scene of a relationality. It, it breaks from racialized blackness, the violence of racialized blackness, the violence of having been black end and opens yeah. onto a blackness that's an infinite canvas of relational possibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if you read it that way, it's like, yeah, that's, that's that's the court scene. That's Julius Irving doing the impossible layup before he even shows up to do it. Right. And you mentioned, I'm not a basketball person, but you, you know, you spoke about how there's the door and there's the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the poem. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's the same thing with with your with your great grandfather's escaping as well. So mm -hmm. this is kind of a third door into or out of. Um, and in this case, it's a it's an aperture into flight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that's good. Right. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So right. good. So yeah. can you talk about the Ross a little bit about the finding of the 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 finding of the pictures um, in the Library of Congress and 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 what you were what you found that you didn't expect to and what you were hoping to find and maybe that you did or didn't. Yeah, I mean that's it. Like um, the thing that I was looking for was like I said was a photograph of. I think I probably the WPA would would have been later than what I was looking for. I was actually looking for it because my great grandfather left. So the story is that his name was Frank Jennings. He was selling. Um, he was a sharecropper, and he and someone else, a white man, were um, selling extra on the side. And I believe the white man turned him in in some way, and he killed him. And that's a family story. And he left. Um, and he changed his name to Jones, Henry Jones, and that's our family's name. Um, <clears throat> I was looking for, that would have been, I was looking in the censuses, that would have been like 19, I think 13 or something. And I was, so I was looking for Teens, Arkansas, 
you know, OCO, you know, I'm looking at OCO, but I didn't know. I'm, the first time I've ever been to the WPA photos or the, or the Library of Congress for that matter. And I was looking for that and, and it was, you know, just going through all the photos and all the photos and all the photos. And it was really just stumbling, stumbling upon this photograph. Um, and, you know, like I like to say, like lyric research, I believe in it. I believe in the thing of like, you don't know what you're listening to until you hear it, you know? And there's a kind of submission like that. Um, and uh, what was the other part of that question? I just, I think you answered both sort of what did you, what were you looking for that you didn't find? Yeah. What did you find that you didn't expect to find? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking for something and, and I didn't find it. And I was looking for something that I didn't know I was looking for. <laughs> You know, it was like that. It was like that. Yeah. Um, I think that we are down on questions that um, from the Facebook feed for now. So people you, um, who are watching, please feel free to put one or two in there. But in case um, none arise, I just wanted to ask the two of you if there are thoughts that you haven't yet shared um, or things that you would each like to ask one another to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. I, you just said rap, and I am like <laughs> rapture. I, I'm like rapture. <laughs> and I was like, um, you know, and, and I think it's kind of, um, you're, I mean, you're, you're writing about rapture and, mm -hmm. you know, and like, you know, I sat in on your class um, um, last, whenever that was, <laughs> last yeah. semester, last year. And, but anyway, I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about rapture period. It could have something to do with flight. I mean, obviously flight, I mean, obviously there are, there are overlaps. So, but I would just love to hear that. Well, I mean, I think that um, the more and more I just keep meditating on this poem of yours, I sort of think that you are saying with the skill of the poet, so much of what I'm trying to think. <laughs> So I'm just like grateful. I mean, I just should like maybe just do a chapter on your work or something. But I mean, I'm thinking I'm I'm really interested in how blackness is a condition of negotiating um being grounded, right? Mm -hmm. Being in some sense propertized and there and thereby um the way in which we propertize the earth and the propertizing of a black life is akin to being grounded. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that, but even more thinking about kind of ecstasy, black, black, black aliveness as a mode of the ecstatic. And so when you talk about flight, when you're talking about the, the, the layup and things of this nature, I mean, this is exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to think about, but also I'm trying to think about this as an alternative imagination of, of, of the sacred, right? Mm -hmm. That the condition of being grounded, the brutalities against the earth, um, the way in which the court system operates and the basketball court moving against the court, um, right. that all of that um, is, a, is a feat of, of religious violence. It's, a, it's an activity of a, of a certain kind of religious mm -hmm. violence. And, and here I'm using religion in a very um, intentionally distinct way where religion ex religion is more than just the religious institutions that we tend to collapse into what religion is about, you know, going to a church or going to, you know, the synagogue or the mosque or what have you. I mean, that's fine. I'm not taking anything away from that. But um, I've been influenced by um, this thinker named Charles Long who recently passed away. And he did a lot of really important work over about 60 years of thinking and writing. And he came up with a formulation that really said that religion um, announces a particular orientation to matter. It's, a, it's an orientation, right? It's an orientation in the world. Um, and black life is a counter orientation to that orientation, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. it's, it's an alternative imagination of the sacred or something I'm writing now in an essay I'm, I'm about finished mm -hmm. with um, I say that black life is para religious. And so when I think about, you know, bringing this back to your work, when I think about what Dr. J is doing and the, the kind of choreography, the, the um, kinetics, the haptics that are going on there, um, the body contort, the contortions of flesh, um, the kissing of the backboard, um, the touching of, you know, 
um, that's happening on the court. You're, you're, you're not a beast. You're, all of that is a counter orientation in the world. Right. Right. And right. that's what I mean by rapture. Yeah. Right. And that's how I sort of think about these, these beautiful descriptions of the court and all that's happening here. I think of it not so much as a church, but certainly I think of it as having churchical impulses. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say churchical, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? I mean it the way the Rastafarians meant it. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm getting it from. Um, but what I mean by it, like the, beyond just pointing to the to Rastafarianism, I'm, I'm also, um, Winnie Sullivan, my colleague, um, who is also um, the director of the Center for Religion and the Human, has um, just published a really wonderful book um, called Church State Corporation. And um, she and a few other colleagues did a book just before that that kind of foreshadowed some of the things she does in her own single authored monograph. And what they, what both she and her colleagues say in this earlier book and what Winnie argues in her current book is that our languages around church have been overdetermined by ecclesiastical, ecclesiasticalism. And she says, we need to desediment this term. And at the etymological level, the word we use for church comes out and has its lineage going back to ancient Greek, Koine Greek, for the notion of the ecclesia, um, E, you know, roughly translated or put into our, our alphabet, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ek meaning out, mm -hmm. klesia meaning roughly gathering. So in a kind of kind of almost like literal etymological sense, I want to play with that term and think of church as the gathering of those who are out mm -hmm. in their sociality. Yeah. This is a yeah. sociality out from the grid of the polis. It's out from the normative order of things. Mm -hmm. The court for me, as you're describing it, mm -hmm. is a churchical gathering. Yeah. It's an alternative yeah. sociality marked oh. by care, touch. Yeah. It's in rapture, yeah. in flight, from yeah. the groundedness of the order of things. Yeah. It, it yeah. ungrounds and unsettles settler colonial groundings. Right. And right. that's what I mean by church at goal. Yeah. And with, that, I mean, and with that adjective on the end, I'm trying to create a little distance from the way in which we want to collapse the idea of church into formal religious institutions but then right. back it up and say, there's another way to think about church, yeah, alternative yeah. socialities. And you yeah. might not find them in the formal institutions called churches. Right. You might find them on the basketball court. Right. And the reason the basketball court, particularly pickup basketball, where there are no referees. Right. There are no, there are no police. Right. You know, it's, it's, again, like talking about court. Yes. You know, it's a place where it's a negotiated, it's a yeah. gathering, it's outside of the the folks who are there who, you know, and, and the yes. court, you know, like at Seeger Court, like I remember it was beautiful, like, you know, you could kind of slip through, you couldn't see them, you know, like some of the gates, um, but there would be like little bends in the gates, but you couldn't see them unless you could see them. Right. You could slip into the court through the gate. <laughs> Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like this alternative or it's this other kind of social space where we're not doing that. Right. We're not doing that. And we're going to do this other kind of practice. Yeah. And it's like the game is infinite. The game yeah. Yeah. kind of don't ever end. Doesn't end. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't end. end. <laughs> so that's what I mean by rapture. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's to be, it's to, and rapture is another cool term, right? Because to come back to your title, um more or less it's a it's a translation a way to like kind of kind of capture the force of another greek term par ousia mm -hmm. um p-a-r and then ousia the greek word for being uh, being in the mode of being caught up snatched mm -hmm. away right mm -hmm. um a, a kind of non-static being right being that is in it, that is a condition of the ecstatic mm -hmm. right and so I sort of see like this book also is trying to get at and think through another mode of existence, another way of being in the world that you constantly have to like keep looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look with. Look with, look with. right. Yeah. Maybe yeah. even more yeah. so look with. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, 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 that's the kind of stuff I'm playing around with with Rapture. Oh, so good. 
So yeah. beautiful. That's so great. Beautiful. Well, we have, I know that we're at a, towards the end of our time, but I want to toss out two more questions for you. One is focused on um, precisely, I think the issues that you were discussing about the court, um, the, the basketball court. And this is from uh, Lisa Marie Napoli. She's asking, and I'm going to give you both at once, and then you can take them in the order you wish. At you wish with the order, with the culture of care and touch on the court. Um, how do you see the players creating these norms? So that's one thing to think about. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to toss out the other one, which will probably be easier to think about. Which is, could you introduce us to some of the artifacts we can see behind you, and how Jay and how <laughs> uh, sorry Ross. <laughs> Ross, 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 and how they in inspire or empower you to create, and do you intentionally keep them close? So those are the two. Those are the two. Uh, those are the two questions for you. And let me know if I need to repeat them. And directly. Yeah, I mean, this time. Evie is like this is a a little Vandercook letterpress. Um, Wonderful. And, you know, yeah, and it's it's nice. It definitely inspires me to create because it's it's a press. And uh, this is another one. I forget the type of that, but I haven't. I've been using that as a stand-up desk lately. That's my. Mm. That's what I use. That's what I use my um, Oxford English Dictionary for my stand-up desk. Uh -huh. uh, but, but, um, yeah. So we do. We make a lot of stuff. And back in the olden days, Jay, you came through here when we were having class down here. Mm -hmm. um, this is where we used to. I would um, sometimes we would we would gather down here um, an alternative gathering space. Mm. Well, and, and oh, it's nice. It, it was nice. We were we, we were <laughs> we were snug in here. We were snug. It's a little different now. <laughs> uh, but um, I think part of the the question to Lisa Marie's question about um, the the site of care or maybe the practices or norms of care. I think the norms of care are are already there. And I think it's already a site of care, and I think the norms of care are there. I think probably what the what the um, I'll say this as a question for you too, Jay. Like I think part of the part of the challenge or the practice is to um, articulate the norms of care, as, to witness the norms of care as norms of care, and to be like, oh, this is what this is this is the practice, like this here is the practice like sometimes you know when you're just talking about basketball like you think the game is about winning the basketball game and it's like i mean if that's if that's the point of the game it's not the game i'm interested in the point of the game i'm actually interested in is the point of the game when you know a couple kids get into a fight and some dad grabs them and takes them off the court and then they all have to talk and they're all like holding each other and they're like sort of negotiating and this one and this one and the dad never takes his hands off the kids and he's holding them by the wrist or holding by the elbows or he's holding them by this and that um and that everyone else on the court is waiting because we know that that's that's called love right <laughs> that's that's called teaching that's called care and it's just like how we live um but um i'll start i'll say that first jay what do you honor what do you no, I'm I'm loving it. I don't even know if I want to touch that because I mean I think that you said it so well. Um, the 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 uh, maybe one of the questions is you know why is it that we often find it difficult to recognize these as norms of care? Yeah. Um, and I think part of what's at stake in beholding in the constant looking is that um, our kind of sensorium. Our senses need to, they, they need to be, they need to be twerked and, and twerked yeah. so that we can sort of yeah. see that actually there are these practices of care that are happening, right? The practice yeah. of love is what the game is, right? Yeah. In the, yeah. in the yeah. broadest sense. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I sort of think that that's, that's what's at stake. And, and even when we wait, <laughs> if the game is paused because we're working something out, yeah. is that yeah. the, the game, the game is weighted, but it hasn't stopped. And that, that's the game became, the game kind of got, like we got tuned up into what the game is. Right. Know? We yes. got tuned up, oh, oh, this is, oh, this is the game. This is the game. This is the game. This is the game. 
Fight is the game, passing is the game, the kissing is the game, but the game gets tuned up sometimes. Or, the, or you realize, oh, this is the game just got tuned up. Exactly. And exactly. we're not, no one's shooting the basketball right now. <laughs> right, right. And it's almost like, I think at one point, I mean, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to find it, but <laughs> you use the word calculation in, at one point mm -hmm. in the text. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a mode of care that is not reducible to calculation, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what makes it, you know, sometimes, difficult for us want to spot it and then even if we get a like a kind of glimpse of it why it kind of like resists falling into something we would want to call maybe like a norm yeah right it's less a norm than it is a kind of open-ended and ongoing practice of, of constant love yeah right yeah. and the permutations that that practice can take um so it's it's the it's the it's a norm <laughs> that defies normativity. <laughs> That's what I was, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, right, right. Right, it, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a non-normative norm or something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, well, which many, I, things can, many things are kind of emerging, they're constantly emerging, they're practicing, they're collaborative. Yeah. They're, we don't quite know, but we're, we're figuring it out, you yeah. know, we're studying it. it. It's, and then you said earlier, the court is like a laboratory, which I think mm -hmm. is a, a quite apt way to think about it. Even if we wanted to like mm -hmm. shift for a moment to something like the hard sciences, when you're, when you're doing an experiment, you allow one discovery, one discovery or even non-discovery to open up another pathway and a channel of research that from the beginning, one could never lay out the norm of what's gonna happen or how it's gonna unfold. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the moment of a new discovery or even a non-discovery, once you try something and say, oh, that don't work. The moment of discovery or non-discovery, you know, sets in motion another kind of um, practice for the new instant. Yeah. <laughs> that might open up another practice for the new instant. And it's that kind of chain of practices that are not regulated. Um, that is the norm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's it. That's it. And, it, and it's funny yeah. that 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 it, that um, that opening up to the to the possible that's not predicted is both in tension with and coexists with um, with the intergenerational transmission of knowledge because yeah. there's there's a there's a there's a coaching on the one hand a, a metaphor that slipped me there but there's there's a coaching or a teaching of what can be expected um, and at the same time there's a looking for something that um, that may that is not expected um, mm -hmm. as the the result of the experiment that 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 may come out that we that we don't know what it will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, there's one final question. Would you be up for taking that? I am. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's from Wendy Bernstein and it says, it's, uh, she asked, would you guys agree with this? Dr. J's flight is a form of transcending limits, escape, as when we get through our bodies into another dimension of space, i.e. in the zone or rapture through sport, dance, drumming, song, maybe mountain climbing, et cetera. So again, Dr. J's flight as a form of transcending limits escape as when we get through our bodies into a, another dimension of space um, in the zone or rapture. Yeah, something like that. I mean, and it's, yeah. it's like the, it's in the midst of limits, imagining, imagining something beyond the limits that are, that are, yeah. that are constraining the flight, something like that. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, I don't know how much more I'll be able to add to that, but I, I too want to say some, something like that. I guess what I just love about this, this meditation on Dr. J is just how you like, the layup is the result of trying to make a way out of no way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, the, 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 the layup itself is an effect of that. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like, it's almost like, I mean, for purposes of the game, is it, the goal is the is the layup to make the shot. Yeah. But when you when you like kind of like turn your head and I kind of look at it with, with with tilted eyes, in some sense, that's just an effect mm -hmm. of the experiment. Yeah, the, the the experiment is the work. That that that's yeah. what's going on, yeah. and um, maybe it's in that sense that you know from the 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 the, the things that were laid out in that question, 
that if we could sort of revise um, our practices so that they become much more richly experimental, mm -hmm. then maybe we've got something else going on and maybe we got something we can truly work with. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the layup is, 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 the layup is just, the, you know, in some sense, it's, it's, the, it's the remains, it's the after effect of the experiment. Yeah, 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 it's an artifact. It's an artifact, yeah. exactly. An experiment, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which That's interestingly at that point, it becomes like another, it, it becomes the, the photograph that remains. Yep, yep, yeah. yep, yeah. Which so, is kind of cool <laughs> because in the book it's so, yeah. it's so, it becomes its own kind of photograph. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the poem is like a photograph. Yeah, yeah. That seems like a perfect, the, 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 the idea of kind of thwarting of impossibility um, and experimentation and culture and cultures of care um, seem like a perfect place to wrap up on in these times. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Ross and Jay, would you both hold on for a moment after Alex cuts yeah. the Facebook feed? But I want to yeah. thank you both for this incredibly rich afternoon um, and for giving giving me and all of the readers something to to put us into our own into a space away from where many of us have been lately um, and while, while taking us back through it at the same time. Um, so thank you for that and thank you to our audience for being here with us and for sharing it. And again, the the, the recording will go up in the next day or two. Um, on to the I Facebook. wanted to say, I wanted to say too, like thank thank you all, of course, for hosting us. Really appreciate it. And I also want to say, Jay, like you know the it's such a you know like thinking with is the thing to me yeah. and like and i'm just like so grateful for you to you for doing it for thinking with you know and i i just feel like incredibly lucky and it's like this is <laughs> my heart is very full right now for the for the conversation and the care that you're you've given to the conversation which is always the case but i'm just i just want to yeah. say it again well, I, I just want to return the sentiment. I, I must. I, I've been raving about the fact that I have the gift of being on the faculty with you and um, just learning from you. And just, I mean, when I got this in the mail, man, I, I texted you, I think. <laughs> I was out, man, I was out on a walk and I was reading this thing walking. I was like, yo, this is like incredible. So, but this is just like the last, this is like one of the just recent kind of manifestations of the gift of a certain kind of communion that we've been able mm -hmm. to like enter into. So I'm, I'm grateful, man. And yeah. it's some things you just can't, you either can't or you shouldn't think about by yourself. So I'm glad that, you know, I've got like yes, this kind yes. of like partner of thought. Yes, yes, same, same, thank you. So thank you very much. And, um, and everybody have a good evening. Thanks everyone for Take watching care and now. listening. Yeah. Thank you.